everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is the Fundamentals of Velocity Indexing webinar. I'm Janice Lansfeld. I'm a product manager here at Sontech. And with me is our senior hydrologist, Daniel Wagner. Thank you, Janice, for the introduction and, and welcome uh, users for attending the webinar. Um, this webinar will basically consist of an uh, overview of the velocity index processes. Um, and if we are able to generate further interest, we definitely reach our goal in this regard. Um, we also recommend that this, these discussions and content be used um, in addition to your current practices and standards that's implemented in your organization. So before we, we dive into the, the technical detail, what I wanted to do first was kind of pull the focus back a little and explain why we put this webinar together. Uh, Sontech, at Sontech, we pride ourselves in keeping in touch with what's going on in the field, and, and these are some of the timely issues that we've been observing. So um, if you, you saw probably some of these in the um, at a web, webinar advertisement, so they probably apply to you to some degree. Um, so for example, there's plenty of hydrologists out there who are very seasoned that are very familiar with the stage discharge um, rating process, but for whatever reason just have never delved into the velocity. Um, indexing piece. And it's just good to have that in your toolbox. Or, for example, you might already use a velocity meter at a site, but kind of the opposite. You really haven't checked it or you don't know what that procedure is. So we're going to show you how to do that. Um, or in general, you, you just don't know what that whole procedure is. How do we know these instruments are accurate? How do we know they're working properly? This could answer some of those questions. Um, of course, sort of the perennial problem, monitoring sites, just some that are trickier than others to get dialed in, to get good readings at. But increasingly, um, we're seeing the need for data to be real time, and they need to be accurate, and they need to be accurate um, right on time. And so the velocity indexing tool, again, is another um, way of ensuring that you have that high quality discharge data. So um, on that note, we did want to point out that this is not a full velocity indexing training. To do that, we'd probably need several days. Um, however, we are uh, planning, probably in the fall, a more advanced velocity indexing training. So if you're interested in that, please be sure to let us know and, and stay in touch. So this isn't a full training, so what is the scope of the webinar? It's to basically show you why maybe you would need it, why maybe you wouldn't need it. So continuously ask yourself as you're watching the webinar um, how these concepts might apply. Just a basic understanding, we'll walk you through some examples, and then we'll talk about the various instrumentations that's used. And like I said, we'll, we'll, um, we'll show you how to keep in touch and get additional resources if you need them. So um, there's plenty of, of different reasons why you're measuring discharge. There's many different organizations uh, watching this webinar and many different sites. Um, but we're all trying to measure discharge well and more accurately. So in that context, we're going to start with some just the basic, basic theory. Yes. Uh, before we discuss the index velocity process itself, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on the state discharge relationships. and, and how is that applicable and why do we need index velocity? Um, with the ideal site requirements, you would want to achieve or have a, some sort of a section control, either by means of a, a natural rock bar or artificial gauging wear. Um, there is a number of hydraulic requirements and site requirements for this type of, of, of section. Um, up to five to ten times the channel length needs to be straight to ensure that you have a, or try to uh, have parallel flow lines. Um, uniform flow conditions, as you can see here, uh, upstream of offer control itself. Um, and the more pertinent the control, the, the more stable the flow conditions would be. Um, there's also another uh, hydraulic requirements, such as the fruit number that needs to be a certain value. Um, and each of those type of structures require a specific requirements. The data quality itself uh, is very much dependent on the accuracy of the data collected during the process. Um, your discharge measurements made, your surveys performed of cross-sections, 
your stage measurements made and the calibration readings um, has a huge impact on this process. Uh, the stage discharge relationship itself, as, as the term indicates, is a relationship developed by the actual stage versus discharge measurement. I and mean, that process is developed over time. And although we are looking for a site with a stable relationship, that is a fairly a relative term because it does change over time. So for a simple stage discharge relationship, uh, the relationship is normally a function of stage. But what if the conditions are such that stage is not the only variable that's impacting the, the actual uh, relationship? Now there is a, a number of, of areas that um, in, and flow conditions that stage is not sufficient to define the relationship of stage discharge relationship. Uh, for example, we don't have any section control in the channel. This could be either an artificial channel, uh, stormwater or irrigation purposes, or a natural channel, uh, especially your larger rivers where uh, at the bottom end of the catchment where artificial or, or, or controls on it permanent. Um, hydraulic structures, we have complex flow conditions at culverts or bridges. Um, and then variable backwater, uh, tidal influences. That's probably the one of the biggest aspects or influences on on stage size relationships. And then where you get a bit more complex, we have unsteady flow conditions, downstream of dams uh, or dam releases, um, and overflow and ponding situations, where you have, in this example, a different discharge on your rising limb and falling limb of the hydrograph. And normal stage size relation development not suited to develop an accurate rating for this. Now the, the current methodology available uh, for handling uh, flow conditions with additional parameters um, is one where you incorporate slope as a parameter. Um, this method entails where you have two separate sites, uh, your main, main site and then a secondary site downstream. The requirements for this is, is to have a site that is located downstream with a straight reach of channel um, with a, s a certain amount of fall and the literature indicate anything between one foot and two feet in, 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 in fall. This requirement will then require two separate sites with dual installations of equipment, uh, benchmarks, staff cages, uh, and the disadvantage of this method is is to firstly establish a site with a straight reach uh, because it can con consist of a couple of miles to have that uh, to enable that sufficient fall between the sites, but it also adds to the overall operational costs, additional equipment um, and man hour to process the data set. Um, this slope can be used for uh, the calculation where it's variable backwater or where there's a changing in discharge. Another method of resolving this is using the index velocity as a parameter. Um, now you can either use current meter uh, results or the Sontec ADVMs, which is basically our SL series or the IQ series, your site looking or your up looking instrumentation. And obviously we're going to focus on the second topic today. Yes, of course. So how is index velocity method applied? Uh, the discharge in any channel either artificial or, or natural can be calculated by the area, or cross-sectional area, perpendicular to the flow and the mean velocity. And the area is, of course, the submerged area multiplied by the mean velocity. So using the index velocity method, uh, we can assign the area and velocity to the following relationships. Uh, area could be assigned to a stage discharge area rating, of a stage area rating, apologies, and then the velocity uh, could be assigned to an index velocity rating to achieve this, the same uh, results. Now the stage area rating, as the, as the term, terminology states, is a, is a rating developed from a stage and actual area. Uh, so what we do is um, we calculate an area for every stage increment. Um, and from those individual values calculated, we develop a relationship between those points. Uh, the cross-section itself um, is, is of importance. Um, it should be in line or, or close as possible to the instrument itself or to the um, ADVM, or acoustic Doppler velocity meter. It should not be based on discharge measurements. Um, 
or other cross sections such as a cross section in line with your gate bolts or the cross section in line or the actual cross section of the uh, of the uh, control in the channel itself. That is a very important factor because the whole index velocity rating principle is based on that specific cross section. And although if you perform it, the discharge measurement with acoustic Doppler instrument such as your uh, such as your M9, you the in, the instrument itself supplies a cross section or area with the discharge measurement, and users just need to to be aware of that they're not confusing um, that that area measured by the instrument with the cross section identified with the stage area rating. The survey method can be one or both of a bathymetric survey and land survey, and depending on the site conditions and flow conditions present at the site. Um, you could perform the, the measurement itself, uh, the bathymetric survey with your M9, um, as long as it's the, the section itself is, is perpendicular to the flow direction, um, you would get sufficient accurate results with that. Um, and then if there's additional land survey required, that can be added um, to the to the bathymetric survey afterwards. And if you're using your M9, you can even um, do the USGS software, right? Yes. To, um, it's called Area Comp. Mm -hmm. um, we found that useful, actually. Yes, definitely. Um, so M9 exports in a MATLAB format, um, and USGS software is able to to import that data set and generate the cross section and x and y coordinates for your for your cross section itself. Your index velocity rating, again as the term states, is a, is a development uh, relationship between the index velocity measured by the instrument and the mean velocity calculated from the calibration measurements. And by calibration measurements is the actual discharge measurements performed by either your M9 flow tracker or even a current meter. Uh, the index velocity that needs to be used in conjunction with that mean velocity needs to be determined. Now with your with your normal calculations or or, or uh, actual index velocity measurement, the user is anything from uh, five minutes to ten to even fifteen minutes in some cases. Uh, the requirement for the index velocity uh, rating development is to reduce that time frame. And the reason for that is, is to get an accurate average velocity or index velocity that can be assigned to each mean velocity. So we suggest, and there's an, a number of organizations that do the same, uh, to reduce it to, to 60 seconds, uh, to then average that time frame when, or time frame it took to do the, the, the actual mean velocity measurement. Um, the, Normal discharge measurements, for example, if it take, took 720 seconds, you would assign or average that same time frame of index velocity and then assign it to the mean velocity. Um, the re regression type that's used for the index velocity rating is dependent on the complexity of the rating itself. If it's a simple rating and, and the rating is only a function of the index velocity, you will use a normal linear regression. Um, if it's a more complex rating where states is an additional parameter to the index velocity, then you would use of uh, multiple regression uh, rating. This, these type of ratings we've incorporated into the Sontech flow pack software, uh, which we will discuss at a later stage. Well, and before we move on, um, we did have a question come in, and I forgot to mention at the beginning, please send your questions in as the webinar is going on, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible at the end. Uh, but there was a question I or, I didn't realize until just now those axes are actually really hard to read. Mm -hmm. So what you're looking at right here on the x-axis is index velocity parameter, and then on the y-axis you're looking at the mean velocity parameter. I think it actually says velocity measured, measure, but um, it's, it's those two variables that Daniel has there, mm -hmm. the index velocity versus the mean velocity. And then the previous axes were in stage area rating, so the x-axis was stage, and the y-axis was area. Yes. Thanks for that question. So what is index velocity? As, as, as previously indicated, that is the, the, the velocity measured by the Sontek Acoustic Doppler Velocity Meter, or the SL or the IQs. Um, Sontek has made a number of index velocity types available for the user, and this, is, this was done for a specific reason. 
for the user to be able to define the specific index velocity that that has a best relationship with the mean velocity. There's a number of, of index velocities, uh, and I'm not going to discuss every one in detail. There's probably two that is of key importance, and that is your main Vx. So Vx is your velocity in the x direction of each cell. So the main Vx is then the average of all the Vx's of every of each individual cell. Um, the second important one is your cell x. That is a user-defined cell, or we call it the integrated velocity cell. So the user can define a certain measurement volume in the in the cross section that you want to focus on. If you have your blanking distance at the beginning of the instrument to exclude any um, instrument interference and, and turbulence that you don't want to incorporate in the measurement volume, and then the cell end. So if you have boundary effects that could affect the measurement itself. So that cell X is then defined or based only on that measurement or number of cells um, within that um, integrated velocity cell. So that's the two main ones. There's a number of others. Um, we are going to publish uh, within the next couple of weeks two documents to to clarify all the other uh, index velocity types as well. Uh, but that's the main reason for this, is to, to, to give the user a wider selection and in a, in a Site condition is not always perfect, and, and this is the main reason for that, is that every site is not going to be the same, and the velocity application is not going to be the same at all. What's nice, though, about getting all of these parameters is that you, you have them to work with back yeah. at the office when you're developing your rating, so you can see which one works best. We'll, we'll show some examples of that. But, for example, maybe cells, maybe you're taking 10 cells, and maybe cells 3, 4, and 5 look like they do the best rating, but you'll want to look at maybe cells two through eight as well. Uh, you can do, you can really get into that kind of advanced analysis to really hone in what you think the best index velocity should be. So whether or not you use it, those parameters are there and they can be very useful. Yes, definitely. So what is mean velocity? Uh, mean velocity is as the term states, it's your discharge divided by area, and that's a discharge measured using either your M9 or your flow tag or, or parameter, and the cross-section area, and this is where the important part comes in, is the cross-section area based on the state's rating, state's area rating, and not the area calculated from the actual discharge measure. This is very important, because as I said previously, the entire index velocity rating is a reference to that cross-section or state rating, and if we use different areas, that will uh, bias the, the calculations. Uh, discharge measurement itself can be either performed by acoustic Doppler or mechanical meters. It is important to note that the, the measurements done by acoustic instruments such as your M9 should not be done in the vicinity of the instrument itself. So we're taking into account the, the beam angles and the, the distance that the beam angles travel. Uh, the user needs to, to perform a site selection where these measurements are going to be with else, outside that specific zone. And there is a possibility to, to, to uh, affect the, the measurements of the, of the ADVM um, and to prevent that it's, it's safer to just move out, outside of that measurement zone. Um, the, the discharge measurements must also be performed concurrently with the index velocity measurements. Uh, because we are developing uh, index velocity rating, we need to have that index velocity measurements together with the, the actual discharge measurements. Um, during steep hydrographs or tidal conditions, um, these type of measurements uh, or, or flow conditions uh, changes fairly rapidly. And with your, with your, your, your normal standards for, for acoustic measurements, um, and even with your, your, your traditional uh, current gauging, there's a certain time limit required to perform an accurate measurement. Um, and in some organizations, it differs from 720 seconds to 800 seconds uh, for, for acoustic measurement to be performed. And that can consist of either two transects, four or six transects, depending on the flow conditions. Um, in these conditions where you have steep hydrographs or taller conditions, uh, the actual flow changes too rapidly. And in some cases, uh, a single transect needs to be used as the, as the measurement. This is going to be uh, site dependent and based on the hydrographer or the user's uh, knowledge of the area and 
uh, the actual measurement itself uh, to see if it's going to be sufficient accuracy or not. Now we've kind of walked us through the basics of the velocity indexing theory. We're going to move on and talk about what you're going to do with that knowledge in the field. So there's three different types of measurements, roughly, that you're going to be looking at making. One of them is just your initial setup measurements. Um, the second is your continuous measurement, so your continuous time series of your velocity data. And then the last one is the calibration um, data. Yes. Uh, this is probably the, the most important, important part of, of any um, operations is, is the field measurements that needs to be collected in the field. Um, the initial measurements um, is, your, is the setting up the instrument itself um, and identifying the location night of the instrument. Um, it is very important to establish um, a benchmark at the site as well. Um, and a lot of organizations have the same uh, operational requirements. Uh, determining the cross-section at the instrument or as close as possible to the instrument uh, before the actual measurements are started because that will assist with the development of the, of the, of the index velocity rating further on. Um, and then performing a beam check, especially in the beginning. Um, that's to make sure that there's nothing affecting the measurement volume that has been identified by the user. Um, it also indicates if there is any possible boundary effects either from the opposite bank, uh, from the from the channel bed, or from the water surface. And if there's any obstacles in in the channel itself, like uh, dead uh, or debris or, or even rocks. Uh, we had an example where uh, instrument was installed in UMAP and uh, you know the entire service was performed. Um, the, all the installation, uh, concrete works, and, and so forth was done. And when we did the final installation, performed the beam check, everything worked fine. Uh, they released a significant amount of water, and there was scouring taking place, and, and boulders and, and debris uh, basically flowed into the, into the measurement volume, and uh, the section was affected. So beam check is critical during the initial stages. It's also a requirement during every site visit. I think fortunately in that particular situation yeah. we were able to keep the site, or they were able to keep the yep. site, but using all of those those um, parameters we were able to adjust which portion yep. of the beam we were using to get the velocity. Yes, definitely. So that was, that was fortunate. Uh, continuous time series, uh, stage, um, all our equipment have for internal uh, states, uh, a vertical beam. Uh, with a redundant uh, pressure sensor. There is, however, organizations that require and the operational requirements to use an external or the primary sensor, if you can call that, uh, for stage measurement. But that is a, that is important key, and it's also important to note that that the, the syncing of the data sets is, 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 is essential, uh, making sure that the date and time, if you're going to use separate instruments for index velocity and stage, will just make that data data processing um, afterwards much easier. So for example, if you do have a separate stage sensor like a pressure transducer, mm -hmm. uh, you would probably want to hook that up to a data logger that would sync yes. the, the collection of both that stage data as well as the velocity data from your your acoustic instrument. Yeah, definitely. Um, the index velocity itself um, is dependent on a number of variables and, and configuration requirements. Um, just please take note that you know some of the, the there is limitations with with communication technology. Uh, the instrument, our new range equipment, can handle up to 128 cells for the side lookers. Um, we our SL500 can only handle up to 10. So it's important to note what you want to use for in the index velocity process. Um, SDI 12 limits the number of cells that you can transfer to a data logger. So if you want to have a, a larger scope of the actual measurements, it's recommended that you perform the index velocity uh, rating process with actually with actual downloaded data sets and not data sets recorded on an external data logger. Calibration data or verification uh, data sets, uh, your discharge measurements needs to be performed um, on a continuous basis. Um, the frequency of that is dependent on the flow conditions at the site itself, um, especially when establishing a new site. Uh, you can't really start with the rating 
until you have a number of ratings. With your space test routes, the relationships, uh, you know, the norm is, and if you have anything between seven and nine measurements in it, and it's well spread across the, the stage range, then you can start with a rating, and then further development is required. This is it's exactly the same with, with your real estate index method, um, and the stage range or the flow range will define how quickly you will be able to develop a rating or not. Uh, staff grade readings or, or or gauge board readings in some uh, some countries is calling it um, is, is essential to verify is your state measurement correct is there any drift, drift occurring is it to the correct datum and so forth so that is a requirement during each site visit um, as, as I mentioned again and I will reiterate it beam checks are important because that will identify if the course and measurements have been affected um, so we've, we've received a lot of times you know, feedback from from uh, queries where you know, it looks like the instrument is, is not functioning anymore, but then it, it, you know, if we evaluate the data set itself, it, it indicates that there's a beam burial or something occurred, or there's LV growth that's affecting the measurement. So it is essential that that you are uh, performing those crucial aspects. Uh, channel cross-section survey, um, all right, it's a requirement initially to do that, uh, and depending on the site conditions and channel conditions, uh, the frequency will depend on that. So if you have more alluvial type of conditions, you will require a bit more frequent surveys, or you have a stable conditions like an artificial canal. Uh, but please note that artificial canals can also also have sediment transport in it, uh, and those cross-section surveys can change as well. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the instrument types uh, you're going to be using if you're setting up a velocity index site. Uh, they basically fall into two categories, uh, an instantaneous uh, discharge instrument or a continuous discharge instrument. Now, we'll be showing you examples using Sontech instruments, but um, we'll also talk about the fact that they don't, again, Daniel mentioned this before, they don't need to be acoustic instruments. There's, there's other instruments out there to do that. Uh, but the, the top instrument there is the Sontech M9 and it is an instantaneous discharge instrument. And as you can see in the picture, the function of an instantaneous discharge measurement is to start from one bank, the left or the right bank, and proceed to the opposite side and collect very high resolution data. And you'll do this back and forth. Um, the, the scope of this webinar is to get into data collection procedure but the instantaneous measurement is, a, is an accurate measurement of your Q, of your discharge, your instantaneous discharge at any point in time, at any stage, at any stage range. So the function of the continuous discharge instrument is to sit, as this picture shows, is to sit there at the site 24-7 and to output a velocity number. But as you can see in the picture, um, the continuous discharge instrument is only projecting a beam in a, into a much narrower slice or swath of the water. It's not giving us that full resolution from left to right, top to bottom. So, so that's why we need to, you might need to take the velocity you get from here and equate it to this, this bigger picture you're getting from all these instantaneous measurements. And that's, that's the fundamental concept of how these instruments are working together. And I should also point out that these are your velocity beams, but we also um, have the acoustic beam here that shows it measuring the stage as well. In the case of the Sontech side lookers, they also have a pressure sensor inside, so you have two sources of stage. So continuous monitoring instruments, they fall, Sontech instruments fall into two basic categories. And you might also hear these referred to as ADVMs, or acoustic Doppler velocity meters. So the, the top one there is the Sontec IQ. And actually, a lot of people, when I show it to them for the first time, they uh, actually, this is the IQ. <laughs> uh, for those of you watching this after the fact, sorry, you probably won't get the video. But um, I, I get people who say, wow, that's, that's a lot smaller than I thought. Um, but here's the Sontec IQ. It's a bottom-mounted system, so it's meant to be mounted on the bottom, as you see in the picture there, with beams pointing upstream and downstream. 
in line with the flow. So here would be the, the x velocity um, and the beams pointing up and measuring the full profile from top to bottom. So that would be a bottom-mounted ADVM. Uh, but also, uh, you could also, if your site dictates, you might need to install a side-looking ADVM. And there's different frequencies available depending on how wide your channel or your river, or how far you need to profile out into the, the cross-section. And so you can, you can see there's different ways of mounting these, these side-looking ADVMs. Here's a vertical railing with an ADVM on it. This, this picture I like, it's just, it shows how you can mount an ADVM on a, on a slide rail, even if the canal is, is um, a natural section. And so uh, in, in either of these cases, the instrument is mounted um, looking out to the side in a horizontal direction. So you don't get a top to bottom profile. You get a left to right profile. Uh, and as we hit upon earlier, you can, even, you can play around and select which one of these you want. Um, another a common question is, do I need to profile across the entire channel distance? And the answer is frequently no. So take that into consideration. The, the portion of the flow that might be best representing um, the overall flow, so the index velocity representing the overall velocity, might be somewhere in the middle. And you might not need to profile all the way across. Uh, yep. Uh, with, with the index velocity method, um, and that's the crucial part about the site selection process as well. Uh, you don't need to, to measure the entire cross-section with the instrument. Uh, but if the, cross, if, the, if the site is representative of the, of the mean velocity flow, you will get a very good result without the ability to measure across the entire section. Which one of these you choose is just dependent on the site condition. Uh, and if you have questions, feel free to call Sontech at any time. We could probably spend a whole webinar talking about uh, site considerations. But there's probably probably one, one correct answer depending on your site, whether you choose a, a bottom-mounted or a side-mounted system. But just know that both of those are out there. So next, um, Sontech instantaneous discharge instruments um, fall into two basic categories. The, the first one there is Sontech's probably most popular product, it's called the handheld ADV. It's a handheld acoustic Doppler velocimeter, but most people know it as the flow tracker. Um, and the flow tracker is used almost exactly in the same manner as your traditional current meter, waiting current meter. So you mount this acoustic head, which serves the function of the, the current meter, on a, a rod. And as you move from left to right, uh, as I described earlier, or right to left, and measure at certain places in, in each of these verticals as you go across, ideally with a minimum of 20 verticals. Uh, you add those all up, and there's your instantaneous discharge. So that's, that's probably the, the most common way of measuring instantaneous discharge. But uh, I know a lot of us are also familiar with the, the ADCTs. And the Sontex ADCT is, is the M9 or the S5. But I, I also showed you can. Sontech does have deeper water instruments as well. Um, but in either case, the M9 or the Sont original Sontech ADP can be used from a, a moving boat, a manned boat, if, you're, if your river's wide and big enough and deep enough. Uh, or it can be tethered in the manner shown here. And again, the, the fundamental idea is to get the, the high resolution profile data as you transect the, the channel from right to left, left to right. And what I would also like to point out is, is, is these two pictures, the flow tracker um, picture of the verticals and then this, this high resolution image, these are actually the same picture. It's just that what the ADCP gives you is one of these verticals every single second and down to possibly two centimeter um, measurements all up and down each of those verticals. So it's basically the same idea. You're just getting many more verticals and much higher resolution in each of those verticals. These two instruments do the same thing, as does a, a, a traditional current meter. So next we're, we're going to go into the, the process of rating development itself. Now this slide is definitely packed with a lot of information, but we thought it was important just to list what, what all of the steps are. So we're going to go through these bullet points rather quickly 
And also at the end, after this, we're going to step you through examples in the Flowpack software. But the, the writing development process is such, as, as Jen has mentioned, there's a number of points uh, that needs to be followed. Um, and there's organizations that's making use of, of uh, spreadsheets to perform the calculations, or you can use our Sontex uh, Flowpack software that, will, that does everything in, in our uh, develop the, the ratings and supply the, the flow calculations, or the, at, at least the, the, the flow values. Um, the state's area rating uh, development Basically, first of all, is identify the or combine the survey uh, data sets, um, either from bathymetric and land surveys, or depending on what source you used. Um, it is also, you know, as, as we mentioned previously, um, you can export it from from your river surveyor using MATLAB, and then uh, USGS has a survey package that you can make use of for free uh, to generate the cross section. Um, the data set itself needs to be adjusted as well, um, because your measurement um, needs to be aligned with your, your data at the site or to your gauge data. It will either determine if you can adjust the, the cross section upwards or downwards to align that. And that is important because you need to reference that to your instrument level um, for, for the actual calculations itself. Um, the development of the state sheet is then based on X and Y coordinates. That is uh, calculated from from your surveys itself, um, and that is then imported into into the software to calculate the areas itself. Um, as mentioned previously, we calculate the cross section area for every stage increment. You know, that increment is used as fine. So if you want to use an external uh, or a spreadsheet, you can decide what the increment is going to be. If it's every centimeter or inch or whatever the case may be, uh, but that is then used to develop a number of points we then uh, define a relationship from. Uh, with your index velocity rating, identifying the data sets that's, that's required, so your, your index velocities that's measured by the instrument, either internal or external stage measurements, uh, and align those data sets uh, to make sure that the time is synced, uh, your discharge data that is that is measured, and your your, calibra, your staff gauge readings to, to verify if your states are correct and if there's any drift occurring. Um, calculate the index velocity and mean velocity. Um, again, your mean velocity is based on your actual discharge measurements, and the area you need, and I reiterate this again, is based on the cross section used for your state's area rating. And this is then used to determine the mean velocity. So calculate your index velocity, as mentioned. Uh, your index instrument or your instrument measures at a certain time interval, but during your discharge measurements, it's recommended that you reduce that sampling interval to 60 seconds. And the reason for this is to get a more accurate average of the index velocity during the same time when the discharge measurement was performed. So, for example, uh, if the discharge measurement took 720 seconds, you want to average those index velocity readings over that 720 seconds. You don't want to include um, data sets that didn't cover or wasn't or was measured during a different time interval or during a different time frame. Develop scatter plots, and that can be used uh, performed in, uh, in a spreadsheet. Um, we our software at this stage doesn't uh, accommodate for that, uh, but you can quickly develop a number of scatter plots in a spreadsheet based on the mean velocity and the index velocity type. And the reason for this is is to identify which index velocity type you want to use. Uh, it would be impossible for you to just identify from the actual result itself. You need to do that comparison. You need to develop uh, a scatter plot and identify if there's any trends in the data set itself. If there's any trends that, that or well-defined trends, then that will indicate that that index velocity is, will have a better relationship than the other ones measured. Uh, and this is uh, a step that needs to be done, otherwise it be difficult to identify the appropriate index velocity. Uh, develop a, a, a linear regression on, on the index velocity selected with your mean velocity, and that's just a simple linear regression, just to see uh, what the, the outcomes of the statistical analysis is and to evaluate the residual plots. Um, if the residual plots doesn't show a trend and it is uh, scattered uh, sufficiently across the x and y coordinates or axis, then 
that indicates that your index velocity that you selected uh, basically represents the mean velocity. If there is things that that, uh, that or if there is pat uh, clusters or or patterns showing in the in the residual plots, then it indicates that there could be other parameters or variables that's impacting on the mean velocity. Um, and then selecting the appropriate regression method. Um, so, for example, if the index velocity itself is the only parameter that's that's uh, that's defining the, the mean velocity, then a simple linear regression is required. If there's other parameters, then you're probably going to look at uh, a multiple regression method to, uh, to develop the, the index velocity rating. So this is in a, in a nutshell what the whole rating development process is. Um, there's a number of steps that needs to be uh, that you know that's, that needs to be evaluated. And I think that the most important step is, is to evaluate the actual uh, plots. Uh, graphic and analysis of the scatter plots as well as the residual plots because that will show you um, what will have what gives the best relationship with the with the rating development. It's very similar with stage discharge relationship is that the evaluation of your graphic and analysis forms a key part. There is uh, regression statistics that needs to be looked at as well, but to be careful on the on the cautious side, don't use the regression statistics as the sole requirement for selecting specific variable. So that was a list of all of the things that you do to, to do your rating. And what we're going to show next is how this concept is applied through the Flowpack software. Now this is a software offered by Sontech uh, specifically to help you generate um, a rating. And what's nice about it is that it has this wizard-like uh, interface that will step you through the process just described. As you can see, it even says start here, and you go through these steps where you do your site detail, you develop an area rating, velocity stage data, discharge data, and the final analysis where uh, the, um, the coefficients are generated. So uh, the first element, as hopefully you learned earlier was the stage area rating and so that's the, the first thing you'll enter into flow pack. Um, Sontag has a number of options or flow pack has a number of options in the, in the software to assist the user. Uh, there's a input channel geometry uh, function where you can physically enter the part diameter or a trapezoidal channel or a rectangle channel and just enter the, the, the top and bottom width and, uh, and the slope. Um, or it has uh, a load stereo eight stage area data where you actually import the X and Y coordinates that was developed from your survey, from your land survey and bathymetric data sets. Uh, and then also a stage area equation. Now a lot of uh, sections have already been developed and you don't have to repeat, repeat the process of importing the actual survey data if you have, if you have already established uh, regression for the for the stage area rating, you can import that function into the software and that will calculate the, the, the area rating. So the next step you'll be walked through is inputting your velocity data. And this would be the velocity data from your continuous measurement instrument. So your, your side looking instrument or your up looking instrument, so your SL or your IQ. And so you'd be importing a time series of those velocity measurements, and that's what you see here. Um, again, this flow pack as a wizard to incorporate the data sets. Um, if you're using View Argonaut um, software to download uh, the data sets, it has a flow pack exchange export format that is recognized by flow pack. Um, if you use your latest equipment, the HCL 3G or Site Lucas and uh, the IQ instruments, their software export an ASCII format, uh, which can be incorporated into the into the uh, flowback software. It's, it's a fairly straightforward wizard. You break up, and it's it's no date requirements uh, when you develop the export or ASCII export. Um, you physically can break up the date and time um, into sections, so it doesn't really matter if it's year, month, day, or day, month, year. Um, flowback software will be able to handle it. Um, with the, the advantage of the flow pack is it will combine multiple number of files. So, for example, if you import five to ten 
IQ files, it would generate a single time, a single time series uh, of all the individual files. So each individual import will create a separate uh, time series screen with the user ability to do any filtering on the data sets, either filtering on spikes uh, or even certain date and times. So for example, in this area, uh, there was probably no measurements performed, and so you can exclude that date uh, or period from the development to make sure that that doesn't influence that in development. We should also add that you don't need to use Sontech data to import data in the flow pack. These data could come from anywhere. They yes. could come from any instrument, any instrument type. Yes, yeah, definitely. There's, there's some of the our users that's using uh, competitor software to, to develop a flow pack. So. It is open. It is a fairly open format, and, and you can incorporate anything uh, or any type of, of, of data. As long as you can get it into an ASCII format. Yep, definitely. So next step, step four would be to uh, import your discharge data, which is represented by these, these series of dots here. So these are just your discharge measurements that you've gone out and taken with one of your um, instantaneous discharge instruments. Um, again, the, the import process is fairly straightforward. Uh, you can create a, a ASCII or CSV format uh, with uh, the date order. The, the order of the columns doesn't need to be in a specific order. You assign it in the wizard itself. Um, and there's only a couple of, of categories that's imported. It's the date and time, uh, the actual duration of the measurement, and the discharge. Uh, the software will also highlight discharge measurements that's not applicable in the rating. So what it means is if you perform discharge measurements uh, before the actual index velocity measurement started or perform discharge measurements after the last download, uh, then the instrument will highlight it red, which means that there's no applicable index velocity information for that period, and you can't use that. So the only data sets that would be able to be used in a process is the ones that's not highlighted. Now the flow pack analysis um, is based on two concepts. Uh, flow pack has a, a simple linear regression solution and a multiple linear regression solution. And the software recommends which analysis needs to be used. This is only a, a recommendation and it's still the user prerogative to decide which um, uh, linear reg of regression analysis he wants to, to make use of. Uh, in, in, in some cases, a simple solution, although will deliver the same accuracy or close to it in any case. Um, with, the, with the development, it will indicate a number of statistics. Um, for example, your R squared, your adjusted R squared, which is uh, a fact that it incorporates that if you include additional parameters, um, if it has a significant statistical significance in the calculations, it will give you a, a a positive uh, result, but if that additional parameter does not have a statistical significance on the improvement of regression, you will be penalized on that. Uh, the number of observations uh, and and so forth. Um, the quality score is developed from that. Um, and this quality score is based on your base score, which is, is determined from your adjusted R squared and the number of observations. Now, obviously, when you start a new rating, the number of observations is going to be limited, and you're probably going to be penalized in that. But that is a starting point. Mm -hmm. um, as, as I mentioned previously, with your state discharge, you know you need to start somewhere. And you know seven to nine measurements is probably sufficient to start. And if you want to publish, and that's very much dependent on the organization um, proper requirements and 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 the users users. Uh, decision on the accuracy of the writing and, and the conditions applicable. Um, if, if, if that's sufficient, then it can be re released for use. Otherwise, you, you will fail the writing until further discharge measurements are available. Um, with this flow packs analysis software, we have a number of selected reports that you can make use of as well. Um, and that is your residual plots residuals plots that's uh, a key part of this process. Uh, and that's to make sure or identify if there's any trends, clusters, or pattern that's occurring in the plots as well. If that's the case, then it means that there's other parameters or variables 
uh, that are affecting the index velocity rating as well. If it's scattered throughout the, the x and the y axis, uh, then it indicates that your index velocity selected is a sufficient parameter for that purpose. Just to come back again, the software at this stage doesn't make provision for plotting uh, or viewing graphically your, your, uh, your scatter plots of your different index velocity types, and for that purpose you need to evaluate that in a separate spreadsheet beforehand. Now, no, well, uh, so basically we've shown you the whole process from start to finish on how to set up an index velocity site and, and rating. But we want to come back to a basic piece of information, which is that you can do all this work and um, generate all this data, but you want to make sure that all of those data and all that work is, is good and put to good use. So site selection is key, even more key than um, I might have heard us stress before. So we're going to take a few minutes and address site selection specifically in terms of setting up velocity indexing. It's, this is probably the, the, the key part in this whole process. Um, and uh, you know, the better site selection and the more time is spent on this, it's definitely going to reflect on the quality of data sets you're going to collect over time, especially if you are planning to deploy this instrument for a number of years to do measurements at a specific location. Uh, site reconnaissance is a valuable part in, in, in this process. Evaluating your historical information from, uh, from historic autographs uh, might identify what is the state change. Uh, try to determine the location of the instrument I and mean, to see if it's going to fit in with the requirements. Uh, is your cable length going to be long enough? If you're going to be using a data logger um, and so forth. If it's at an existing site, then you know, most of those answers uh, or questions have already been answered, um, although you still wanted to know that the stage range to identify is the instrument, are you going to be within the limitations of the instrument uh, capabilities. Trial installation is an important factor. I know it's additional work and it, it, all of us are pressured to get the instrumentation and then to get the results on the table, but this is a key part. Um, you know, even if it takes a couple of weeks or months, this is ident identifying is the site that you selected appropriate for the use of this type of instrument. Um, and please take note that it doesn't mean that you have an existing stage mode in site. It will be suitable for the use of, a, of a acoustic Doppler velocity meter. Discharge measurements during the, during the site selection process is, is, is also important to determine velocity distribution, um, to determine if there's any obstacles in that, in that uh, section itself. Although with an with a M9, you will have to do multiple passes uh, to perform that. Server requirements. Um, does your section or your cross-section shape comply with what is required? Um, is it going to influence the measurements itself? Is, it, is there going to be any boundary interference um, on the actual measurements? Uh, photographs is, is an important part. You know, normally, during your site reconnaissance, you'll, you'll, you'll visit the site during certain flow conditions. Um, and some sites take uh, a certain amount of time to change flow, um, you know, especially in these days where we have extended droughts or extended flood events. Um, it is important to know what happened in the past. Um, we have a number of users that's, that's doing dry installations. For example, installing an IQ in a culvert. There's no flow. Um, you know, you know where to exactly to install the instrument. Um, these, you know, culverts have complex hydraulic flow conditions. Uh, you don't want to install it in an area where there's uh, supercritical flow or where there's even hydraulic jump in a culvert. Um, so those type of things needs to be considered. Uh, for the users that have uh, that are fortunate enough that have an M9 and a hydro surveyor package, uh, this is probably the best tool for evaluating a site for for the applicability of an ADBM instrument. Hydro um, surveyor is capable of performing a bathymetry survey using. Kind of see that these these depth contours here are from the all the depth readings of yep. so the bathymetry mm -hmm. survey that it's capable of. So basically, in short, using five different transducers and, and, and perform a mapping exercise of the, of the depth itself. So five individual uh, depth measurements simultaneously. We also perform velocity measurements at different levels um, within the water profile. 
that would be, as you can see, we, we did all these transects back and forth, back and forth. So here's our track line, and each of these sticks coming off is the, the velocity vector measure. So we get a picture of the velocity measured there. But ultimately, we, can, we, we want to see this. Which is basically a, a velocity vector plot, um, which uh, the iris surveyor generate, and we can generate this for the bottom layer, middle, and top layer of the water column. Um, and this is the, the important part, because you don't see this by the naked eye. And even with your M9, if you're going to do uh, discharge measurements, uh, or a couple of transects, you will need to do a, a number of transects to really identify what the actual flow pattern is. And you know, from what is evident at, what's at, at this specific bridge, is that this location is probably not suited for the instrument, and the, the flow conditions upstream of the bridge is much more suited to the uniform requirement. It's not required, certainly not required to do um, a, a survey of this magnitude, but it, it certainly certainly helps. Definitely. Um, hydraulic requirements is also, and I'm not going to go into detail with this, we are planning to, to publish a document later this year about site selection uh, for ADBMs, um, which will highlight those specific details in much more uh, detail. Um, instrument specifications is important. Um, you need to you want to stay within the requirements of the instrument itself, you know, your state sensor range, um, and then, you know, your, your acoustic profiling as well. You know, your SL3G 3000 is not going to profile so far across the, the, the section where your SL5 on it. Um, so that's also very really site dependent. Um, instrument position relative to a cross section. This question has been asked a number of times, and, and the flow conditions from from country to country varies drastically. Um, you know, the norm is to, to have a site looker in the region of mean velocity, or your up looker in the region of maximum velocity. So, if your up looker is fairly, it's not as a complex task to achieve that. But with your site lookers, it is. Um, in some areas, you know, if you look at larger rivers, like the Mississippi, for example, you know the the stage range is not so significant where if you go to areas, for example, in Australia or South Africa, where you have up to 25 meter stage range or, or stage uh, range, that has an impact on where you actually select it, the, the position of the instrument. There's not a clear cut answer for this. Um, it is suggested that trial installations would definitely be a requirement for this, is to install the instrument, probably dependent on what your measurement requirements are. Start at a position, do a trial installation, and see if it works. Um, unfortunately, it is going to require man hours and, 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 and operational costs. Uh, there have been users that are using multiple instruments across a, a section in those type of situations, but that adds to the complexity of the process, the calculation. For starters, Flowpack software doesn't handle multiple instruments, um, and those type of calculations needs to be done either in a, uh, uh, advanced spreadsheet calculation or uh, use it a use it a build-up software package. Beam check again is essential during the process. Um, and then maintenance uh, is probably one of the key aspects. Uh, cleaning of the ADB entrance users during every site visit, if possible. So obviously during our flows it won't be, but if the flow conditions allow, uh, use a soft broom or something similar and clean the entrance users, uh, removing algae growth or, or sediment or whatever the case may be. Uh, correct alignment and position is probably the key part. If you're going to remove the instrument from maintenance or replacing the instrument, the position of the instrument needs to be known. The height, the orientation, and the instrument needs to be uh, repositioned in that exact position. Uh, if not, you can affect the relationship that was developed between the mean velocity and index velocity. And it could be so severe that you will have to re uh, restart the entire uh, Rating mm -hmm. process. Um, so that initial stage, when you install the instrument, do a survey. Survey the instrument of a level, tie to a benchmark, making sure the orientation can be fixed, um, either by a, a, you know clamping down or a, the, the frame or whatever you're going to use to mount the instrument on. But just make sure that that, that relationship is stable uh, during the installation. So lastly, um, we hope you got something out of this webinar. And if you're interested in learning more about velocity indexing,
please let us know. We're planning another course, a more advanced course in the fall, and uh, we'd like to know your interest. We also have various events, not necessarily specific, specifically on velocity indexing, but a chance to, to hear and learn more about um, the instruments that we have at some of our roadshow events. We have those going on um, at various times, so just stay in touch with your local rep or check in with Fontech.com, which has a lot of resources. And if you are signed up for the webinar today, uh, we'll be sending out an email afterwards that has a copy of this PowerPoint. We'll have all the questions that we won't get to, which unfortunately is most of them, but we'll make sure those get answered. Everyone will get a copy of those Q&As. And then we'll have some of the references that Daniel talked about, um, links to those. So we'll give you plenty of resources and, of course, always get in contact with us um, if you need to. And with that, we can probably probably do another five minutes and, and handle some questions. <clears throat> Let's see. Can you give an idea of where to place a side looker in a vertical position? We have a high variable in stage, so we find it difficult to place. I think uh, Daniel hit on this um, a minute ago where for example, he was talking about in Australia, there, there's such a wide stage range. I'm afraid there's no real pat answer for that, except to do some trial installation that will probably take a little bit longer to generate some data and, and go through your rating process. Another thing to consider might be where is the most critical point where that data are going to be needed, what decisions are going to be made with those data, and, and could that possibly inform where it's most critical to have it placed ideally. We didn't get into exactly where in the, um, where in the water column it should be, but ideally it's where the, the level of maximum, maximum velocity should be. Yeah, so the, with the ACLs, um, you know, uh, depending on what the requirements are, if, there's, if you want to protect the instrument against the environment or for whatever reason, you don't want to expose the instrument in the open air during, during low flows. Um, We've, we've seen some results from, from users where you know, the instrument was at very low flows and there was about an 8 meter, 9 meter stage range above it. Um, and we're still able to, to get a very accurate index velocity rating. But that is going to be a very site specific thing. Um, and as I said, unfortunately, there's not a clear cut answer. And trial installations will definitely highlight um, if that is feasible at a specific location or not. Another instrument related question. How does the IQ use the lateral beam data in the velocity index uh, calculations? So this question is referring to the, the, the lateral or the skew beam. So the IQ has beams that look forward upstream and downstream, but they also have beams that look out to the left and right. That's, that's unique to Sontech. And the answer is, uh, it's one of those parameters that we give you, and you can use the left beam and the right beam, one or the other. You could use those in combination with the fore and aft beams. You could not use the, the skew beams at all. Uh, so it's up to you, and how the, how the rating is best going to look is going to depend on what that, that regression analysis um, produces. I would say the majority of users probably find that the fore and aft beams are, are adequate. There are certainly other users out there who like to use the average of the skew beams and the fore and aft. Um, and in some cases, I think I even saw someone who was using uh, just one skew beam. So uh, as many different sites as there are, there are as many different flow conditions. Yes. Maybe just to, to, to give the users a, a bit of background about the IQ. And, and the reason why the skew beams were developed is to, to make the instrument adaptable to non-uniform non flow conditions. And as I said previously, that you know, uh, perfect flow conditions are very seldom seen, in, 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 especially in natural channels. And uh, you know, your normal or well-distributed velocity distribution is 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 something that we wanted to strive to, but um, in, in most cases, it's not possible. Uh, and that's the purpose of the skew beams, is to, to incorporate those uh, flow distributions or, or flow patterns that's not to the required um, or what we want to strive to. And, and that's the reason why the skew beams are incorporated. Um, if, the, if the flow pattern is, is, 
for water velocity distribution is, 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 is well defined and in a uniform manner, then your four and a half beams would be sufficient. Um, and that's what most users would probably use. Uh, and that's why the IQ has also a number of index velocity types. Um, and, and that's why it's also important to evaluate each one of them um, against your mean velocity to see which one defines the relationship the best. Okay, with a related question on the IQ. Maybe we'll just do that one. Sorry, we're, we've gone a little bit over. We'll do this last question, and then, again, we'll make sure all these are answered in the FAQ document. Yeah. So related to the IQ, there was, what is the minimum water depth that a bottom-mounted IQ could measure? Minimum is about um, 8 centimeters or 3 inches on top of the instrument. So a good half foot of water about, approximately, depending on how high you mount it off the bottom. So with that, thanks for your attending and thanks for writing all these great questions. We'll get those answered and um, there's our contact information uh, should you want more. Yes, thank you very much for attending the webinar and uh, sharing our knowledge and experiences with you.